On April the 11th, 1963, Gloria and Aubrey Gibbons welcomed their Caribbean twin daughters to the world, June and Jennifer. They were born in Yemen, but soon moved over to the United Kingdom, originally England, but in 1974, when they were 11, they moved over to Wales. The twins weren't the only children in the family, having an older sister Greta who was six by the time the twins were born, an older brother David who was four, and they would also go on to have a younger sister called Rosie as well. Their mother Gloria was a housewife and their father Aubrey a technician within the Royal Air Force. Despite their Caribbean heritage, the family spoke English at home, but once the twins hit talking age, things began to get strange. They were both born with the exact same speech impediment as one another, which delayed their talking abilities a lot more than other children their age. But because of this speech impediment, people found it extremely difficult to understand what they were saying, including their own parents. The twins hated repeating themselves all the time, so they began to limit just how much they would actually say in front of people, and relied solely on each other for companionship. Me, me and my sister spoke, we knew what we were saying. My mother had to guess what we were saying. And she was the one that was a bit worried about us. And a bit frustrating, and we had to repeat ourselves more often. And then we couldn't be bothered to repeat ourselves, we didn't speak, and left it. And they kept saying, what are you saying? What are you saying? And we just said, oh, you can't hear us now, you can't hear us never. So we decided not to speak, and we got into a habit of not speaking. The girls were utterly inseparable, but weirdly began to speak a strange language between themselves that only they could understand. Furthermore, they were the only black children in their school, which led to heavy bullying. The school administrators even decided to begin sending the girls home early every day to prevent them from being harassed. Due to the trauma, their language and dialect changed and became even harder for people to understand them, almost entirely unintelligible. It reached the point they no longer spoke to anyone except each other and their sister Rosie who shared a bedroom with them. They would mirror one another's actions, sometimes even pretending to be each other for the day, and from that point on, they didn't let anybody else into their own little world. Rosie soon moved into her own bedroom, and they no longer talked to her either. They would only communicate with their own parents through writing letters. We had a ritual. We'd kneel down by the bed and ask God to forgive our sins. We'd open the Bible and start chanting from it and pray like mad. We'd pray to him not to let us hurt our family by ignoring them, to give us strength to talk to our mother, our father. We couldn't do it. Hard it was. Too hard. The girls also refused to eat or drink in front of others if they could help it. At home, they would always eat meals or drink inside their room. At school, they would eat incredibly slowly and with very small portions for each bite, to the point they were often the last ones left at the table. At school, they refused to read or even to write anything, so much so the teachers even doubted if they understood English at all. Eventually, they did briefly respond to some questions, but it was rare, and sometimes they would only communicate with a machine. My name is Jennifer. Alright, and again? That's much clearer. Right, let's have it again. My name is Jennifer. During this period, in 1974, the girls were 11 years old when they went through a standard health check and displayed an unusual lack of reaction to being vaccinated for tuberculosis, described as being doll-like, whereas all the other children reacted somewhat to being jabbed. During all of the therapy visits, one particular professional attempted to get them to talk, but as always they refused, but they did consent to being recorded if they were left alone. Upon analysis, it was revealed that the girls were speaking in a sped up version of English mixed with Bayesian Creole, a language used in Barbados. At this point, they were sent to a child psychologist. Several therapists attempted to get them to communicate with them or others but failed. They were even separated and sent to different boarding schools in hopes to break their isolation, but they ended up in a catatonic state whenever they were apart. On one occasion, it took two people to get June out of bed, and once done, she propped herself up against a wall completely stiff and heavy as if she were a corpse. 
She also refused to eat, drink, use the toilet, or even dress herself. But what makes this even more bizarre is that the separation was their idea. Both girls felt like they might be able to talk if they were separated. The therapists decided to take one away somewhere else, but left it up to the twins to decide which one. And this led to a massive argument between them. The girls went from being completely silent to having a loud and somewhat verbally violent spat over it. Therapist Anne Trehan felt the sense that June actually did want to talk to her, but it was Jennifer coercing her otherwise. Jennifer sat there with an expressionless gaze, but I felt her power. The thought entered my mind that June was possessed by her twin. But this wouldn't actually be too far from the truth. They both kept extensive diary entries, and in June's, she wrote about how she felt possessed by her own sister, calling her a dark shadow over her. While in Jennifer's, she described her and her sister as fatal enemies, calling June a face of misery, deception, and murder. Jennifer wrote that she wanted another twin, that June was far too different for her liking, and she longed for another. The girls were seemingly inseparable, but privately had shown great disdain and fear for one another for about a decade. I'm not ashamed to say that I tried to kill my sister. Things got out of hand. I did not succeed in strangling her with a wire to the radio. I'm sure she wanted to kill me too. I have a grave feeling she did. We were fighting. I pushed her in the river. I said to myself, if I kill her now, maybe I'll have a happy life. No more hassle, no more stealing my personality, no more fighting, no more arguing. Get it over with. I pushed her in the river and I held her down. I said, all right, go on, die. The girls isolated themselves in their bedroom for years, creating unique plays together with their dolls. They made up their own stories and did actually record them, but only for the younger sister Rosie to listen to. By Christmas in 1979, when they were 16 years old, they planned to begin their careers as published authors. They both kept a collection of stories, poems and novels, usually set in the United States, specifically in Malibu, California. These stories would involve young men and women who portrayed strange and sometimes criminal behavior. One novel in particular was written by June entitled Pepsi Cola Addict. It follows a high school hero who is seduced by a teacher and then sent away to a reformatory where a homosexual guard makes a play for him. This was the story that they wanted to make big. The girls put together their money to get it published and it did actually make it to print. Several other stories followed by both girls but none reached publication. In 1981, the twins were 18 years old when they met two American teenage boys. Their stories made it perfectly clear that they had some obsession with the United States, and they soon fell in love with the two boys. They introduced the girls to sex, drugs, and alcohol, leading to them committing petty thefts and leading a much more rebellious lifestyle. However, it was short-lived as the boys left them to return home to the States, leaving the girls completely broken-hearted. In retaliation, they committed arson and burned down a building, leading to them being arrested and sent to High Security Mental Health Hospital Broadmoor. They were sentenced to indefinite detention. They would remain here for 12 years. June claimed that they were only there for so long because normally it would only be two or three years, but they refused to speak, extending their sentence. The girls were kept on separate wards as one another, though they were allowed to visit. They were also given tranquilizers in hopes that it would get them to finally talk. And it worked, but it took two years to do so. We got 12 years of hell because we didn't speak. We had to work hard to get out. We went to the doctor and we said, look, they wanted us to talk, but talking now, he said, you're not getting out. You're gonna be here for 30 years. We lost hope, really. I wrote a letter to the home office. I wrote a letter to the queen asking her to pardon us, to get us out, but we were trapped. I really aim to be alone, yet 
Am I deceiving myself? Can I stand being alone? My heart does not beat so fast now. It only beats fast when Jay is around. When they weren't visiting one another, the girls would write letters to each other. My dear June, I agree a lot with you about we two being old spinsters left on the shelf because, to be honest, I've had enough of men. Any relationship always ends for me. I can do without them. You are my only relationship, like sister to sister. I know I'll die young and way before you, but it doesn't really matter. I only hope you'll be happy still. Love, Jenny. During their time inside, journalist and mental health campaigner Marjorie Wallace began visiting the twins and almost immediately noticed extremely concerning behaviour. She claimed that they had very bizarre rituals where they would decide who would wake up first or who would even breathe first. One wasn't allowed to breathe until the other one did. Marjorie visited the twins frequently in Broadmoor and surprisingly over time began to gain their trust and they slowly even chose her to be the only person that they would speak to in detail in years. They desperately wanted to be recognised and famous through their writings, to have them published and to have their story told. And I thought, maybe one way of freeing them, liberating them, would be to unlock them from that silence. Slowly but surely, the girls would talk to Marjorie, just a few words at first, but over time they would react to her jokes and they would thoroughly enjoy each other's company, filled with laughter. However, she always sensed that Jennifer was giving June subtle hints to stop talking and seemed to be controlling her. During this time, they were both on antipsychotic medications, which damaged their ability to concentrate. Jennifer started to suffer from tardive dyskinesia, a neurological disorder which causes movements in your body that you are unable to control. She also began to suffer from blurred vision. These medications were supposed to help them continue their stories, but they both lost interest in their writing and that passion came to an end. The girls allegedly decided that if one of them dies, the other should finally speak to people and go on to live a normal life. During their stay in Broadmoor, they believed that one of them had to die. Jennifer allegedly agreed to sacrifice herself, but this isn't exactly what happened. I took my daughter in and we went through all the doors and then we went into the place where visitors were allowed to have tea and we had quite a jolly conversation to begin with. And then suddenly, in the middle of the conversation, Jennifer said, Marjorie, Marjorie, I'm going to have to die. And I sort of laughed. I said, what? Don't be silly. You know, you're just about to be freed from Broadmoor. Why are you going to have to die? You're not ill. And she said, because we've decided. And at that point I got very, very frightened because I could see that they meant it. Marjorie informed the doctors of this conversation, but they dismissed it, promising that the girls were under complete supervision at all times. On March the 9th, 1993, the twins were just a month away from turning 30 years old when they were transferred from Broadmoor to Caswell Clinic, which was a lot less restricted with less security. They left Broadmoor and as the gates closed, Jennifer rested her head on her sister's shoulder and said, At long last, we're out. She then went to sleep and never woke up. Less than 12 hours later, Jennifer Gibbons was pronounced dead. She had passed away from an inflammation of the heart called acute myocarditis caused by a massive swelling around her heart. This is usually caused by a disease, drugs or poison, but there were absolutely no signs of any of these in her system. Some theorised that the medication may have caused it, but June was under the exact same influence and was in perfectly healthy condition. Her death remains a mystery. As per their agreement, June finally spoke fully for the first time in decades and claimed that Jennifer had been acting strangely for about a day before her death. She complained of feeling weak and tired. Her speech had begun to slur and she even claimed that she was dying. But others also stated that June herself was acting strangely upon finding out that her twin sister had just died. I'm free at last, liberated, and at last Jennifer has given up her life for me. 
Just days after her death, June was described as being in high spirits and not at all like someone who had just lost her sister and best friend. Though her diary tells another story. Today, my beloved twin sister Jennifer died. She is dead. Her heart stopped beating. She will never recognize me. Mum and Dad came to see her body. I kissed her stone-colored face. I went hysterical with grief. Now Jennifer had passed away, June was finally released on parole after 12 years of isolation. She was finally free. June continued to give interviews to the press, but by 2008 she went quiet and started to live independently and out of the spotlight in Wales near her parents. She decided to put the past behind her and to move on with her now normal life. However, in 2016, her sister Greta did do an interview where she blamed Broadmoor for ruining their lives. She claimed that they neglected Jennifer's health and she even wanted to sue the hospital, but her parents refused to allow it as it wouldn't bring Jennifer back. Some believe that her death was planned, whether by Jennifer or both sisters. That they felt they spent their childhood having experiments done to them. And if there was only one of them left, they wouldn't be seen as unique or strange, and wouldn't have to go through that experience again. But what really happened between these two twin sisters to make them resent each other so much? What caused their nearly 30 years of silence? And how did Jennifer Gibbons really die that day? This is a case of bizarre circumstances that hasn't become any less strange over time. And as June Gibbons continues to live her life out of the spotlight, the rest of us remain seeking answers.